Okay. So, that's from nearly ten years ago, and as I say, it was the first time everybody had seen this kind of data visualization. So, what kind of messages was he picking up out of that video? What smart insights do you think? Can you pick any out of that? What do you think of the nature of the way the data is visualized there? Interesting way, actually. Yeah. Yeah. This is why it had such a big impact on people ten years ago. Okay. So, how does that link? Do you think with uh, Tim Berners-Lee? What are the what are the connecting things? We talked about Tim Berners-Lee last week, and Tim Berners-Lee reflect mentioned this hands rolling. What what's the connections? Do you think between them? reflecting data yeah. and visualizing? Yeah, okay, well, let's go back to the data a minute. What was Hans what was Hans Rowling talking about in terms of data? That little diagram he put up with the Make it accessible, accessible for everyone and searchable. Yes, exactly. He was he was arguing that all this data, you remember how the little sort of roots underneath the ground, he was arguing that the data needs to be much more readily available for us to use. And it's got that way, as he was talking about. We've now ten years later, and we saw last week that we've got access to all those data sources now. And Tim Berners-Lee as well, very influential person in the world today, uh, founder of the web and all that, he's saying exactly the same thing. So he's pushing along as well. Um, okay. So that is, as I say, a very key uh, presentation from nearly ten years ago that really got everybody moving and inspired. And you may be able to do something similar in your work. You know, certainly, the gap minder stuff is is readily available to you. We'll have a maybe look at some of you might be looking at this later on in the session. So, I've talked about new technology using computer power in innovative ways to show how to visualize data that we can then make conclusions from and draw conclusions from. Let's go back couple of hundred years to see what it was like then. Um, so there's a guy called William Playfair who is credited as being the first person to present data, st produce statistical charts in line graphs and use bar charts and, and pie charts. And this work that he did is now what we use today. He set the, the patterns, he set the techniques up that we now automated in computing but in the, this, he's actually set the ideas of using the data in this particular way, demonstrating this particular way. So he produced in the um, late 1700s here these charts. It's off the edge of them, off the edge of the page. You can see it better on your screens. These charts, uh, and these don't look any much different to what modern charts look like. They're just hand drawn. You know, we can produce this well. You can, in effect, produce them using modern software, but these are hand-drawn graphs from, say, from late 1700s, where he established the, the mechanisms for doing this particular visualization. And this one here, it uh, <coughs> exports and imports to and from North America from the UK. So you've got imports here from North America, and then you've got the exports here. Um, and so you can see that how it changes. Imports go up slightly and then down and then up again. And the imports, so the exports here from the UK to America. And most of the time in this in this period, the, um, we were making the money making. And in fact, we were exporting more than we were importing. So we were making a lot of money from, from the North American colonies, in effect. So that's what that's showing. We're making a lot of money here because we've got more exports than, than imports. And again, this one here is a whole set of lines over, let me see better on here, over several hundred years, well, 1772, sorry, not several hundred years, 50 years or so, 1770 to 1824, of different prices and different commodities, uh, UK debt, price of stocks, and things like that. So we can see, um, which one is it? Bread here. So this yellow line here is the price of bread over that 50 years. Difficult to follow when you get to the middle of all these others. 
but it follows around here and we can track it along over the 50 years there. Uh, and what's the other one at the top? Um, can't quite see it even on there. Is it? What's that top one, that blue one? It's difficult to see it. What's this one here? Price of something, I think it says. Price of stocks, there we go. Price of stocks. So this is the sort of um, price of stocks and shares. So again, you can see it tracking all the way through over the, over the 50 years or so of this, of this graph. So he's establishing the techniques that we now take for granted today. And at the time, this was all new, a bit like a bit like Hans Rosling. He was showing some new techniques visualizing, visualizing data a couple of hundred years ago. This guy, was William Playfair, was also showing us some new ways of how to visualize data. And there was also other people around at the time doing similar things. Florence Nightingale, you may have well have heard of, I'm sure, was a famous sort of improving the hygiene of, of hospitals and things. But she was also a statistician. And um, at the time, there was sort of wars going on in the Crimea over here, Russia up here, Crimea here, which has been in the news fairly recently, actually, the Crimea, of course. Um, but at the time, there was wars between Britain and France and Russia over this patch of ground, the Crimea here. And Florence Nightingale was, was, was working in the hospitals of, for the, for the um, injured, and she was trying to show that by improving the hygiene of the hospitals from diseases that the soldiers shouldn't have been dying from, that basic hygiene um, discipline would actually, would actually reduce the, the amount, of people, amount of soldiers dying from preventable diseases. So she produced these graphs again a bit like Rosling and Playfair, an important diagrammatic tool that she used to show the effects of, of the data. So the blue, this, this is uh, causes of mortality in the army in the east, in the Crimea War, 1885 to 1856. So this is for a year here, going June, July, August, September, around back up to June again. And then this is 84 to, uh, sorry, 60, 54, 54 to 55 again. Uh, it was January, January round, January, February, March, don't dine off here. But the blue sectors indicate the amount of unnecessary deaths, basically. When, if we improve, she was arguing that if we improve the hygiene carried out in hospitals, we, would, we wouldn't have this many soldiers dying unnecessarily. And she used these graphs to try and change um, hygiene practice in the hospitals to try and visualize visualize the data to get smart insights if you like to then make changes to to, to practices for public benefit if you want to relate it all to the all to the, um, the assignment and the sort of key themes of what we're doing so that was another key visualization and then another one is a guy called Minard uh, who again war again, unfortunately, but hey, there you are, um, between the Russians and the French, and um, in which the, the French suffered a, a very big losses in terms of the, in terms of the soldiers. So 400,000 or so were, the army was about 400,000 before it set off to go to Moscow. About 1,000 got to Moscow and then only 10,000 returned. So that's a very big, big um, loss of, of life there. Now those figures are quite stark in a way, but when you put it in a different kind of form, in a sort of a graphical form, different visualization, if you like, where the, where the, um, so we're using, a, we're putting the data, we're putting the data on a map, <laughs> like we like we have done in, in you know like we do today even. We're putting the data on a map to make the the image and the, get the message over much more powerfully. So the, the, the width of the line here 
shows the num is, is proportional to the number of soldiers in the army and this is their route across from the French border across to Moscow here and you can see how it, how it um, gets smaller and smaller so it was 400,000 set off, 1,000 got to Moscow and on the way back losses continually all the way along the route back when only we got 10,000 back uh, at the end and this is a temperature so we're overlaying temperature as well onto the graph um, so they suffered a lot through the cold which, which many of them didn't survive well large proportion didn't survive so we're actually thinking about it this is an example of linked data we talked about the other week we're compiling different data sources and different different ways of visualizing data to create a quite a powerful image of of the issues and what happened at this time and you know there's a, there's a saying that a picture paints a thousand words this kind of graphic really illustrates the the, the brutality and the effect of these things. And then there's another another example. Um, we, there was a cholera 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 epidemic in London in the mid 1800s. And at the time, we know all about cholera these days. But at the time, there were people didn't understand how it how it how it spread. They thought it was through through the air, contaminated vapours, just by just picking up bugs through the air. They didn't realise until the mid 1800s that it was actually through contaminated water through the sewage system that was, was creating the cholera, spreading the cholera. And what happened at the time was that, again, we mapping data is exactly what we're doing today. We put in data information onto a map to try and work out what's going on. And what they found was, or what this doctor found was, by plotting the, the cases of cholera here, these dark blobs indicate the um, number of cases of cholera. And what they found was that there was a concentration of cases around a particular pump here, which was actually spreading the, the cholera. People going to this pump were then getting cholera. So they took the pump out, and the, the number of cases of cholera decreased. Um, so again, we're using, we're using data, cholera statistics, putting on a map to get, to get insights into uh, particular problem areas for public benefit. And these are all words from the assignment that, uh, that we're talking about. So again, another, another important um, visualization example. A more recent event which I remember watching on TV at the time, 1986, was this uh, shuttle disaster in, in nearly 20 years ago actually. And this should never have happened. If the data that the engineers, the, the engineers had all the data, had all the information about the performance of these parts of the shuttle and they didn't really, they didn't interpret it. It wasn't presented to them in a way that meant they made the right decision. Or they, they had all the information necessary, but they didn't make the connections between the, the, the particular factors involved. Um, so in, 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 in sort of simple terms, there are these rubber rings. This is the sort of rocket here. And there are these rubber rings sort of connecting the different parts of the rocket together. And they're, what, a quarter of an inch thick and, what, 11 metres in circumference. So quite, quite narrow bits of rubber. And these, these failed in the launch of the Challenger and the, and the fuel exploded, killing all, all the seven members of the crew. Now, the engineers had been monitoring in previous launches the failure rate of these rings. And they f they'd seen that the failure rate increased with a decrease in temperature. And there was a lot of discussion, and there was quite a cold day when this uh, launch was taking place. And they were, they were debating on whether to, to launch the rocket. And there was also a lot of pressure from government, which had been delayed and delayed, so there was a lot of pressure to actually get. It's a big public event. But they made the wrong call, um, because they didn't have the, the right information to get at the right place at the right time. Uh, and it resulted in this explosion here. Um, so 
when they investigated more carefully, they found that the charts they'd used didn't connect the damage to the, the old rings with, with temperature. So six contained no table data about, about either old ring damage. The seven remaining charts contained data on either launch temperature or old ring anomaly, but not, but not in relation to each other. Okay, so I had all the data. They should have made the right decision. They didn't, uh, and the, this disaster happened. Um, and um, this is the kind of information that we're using. So this is the temperature here of the launches, and then this here is information about the the old rings and the state damage to the old rings that they found. Um, and another diagram here. But if that was so, it's not really clear from these diagrams, even though they're engineers, exactly what the problem was. But if you replot the data in a different way, it's the same data, but visualised, if you like, in a different way. And um, Edward Tuft, we'll come to shortly, rearranged or replotted the data. So this is the, the temperature along the bottom here. And then this is the, the amount of damage, an indicator of amount of damage to buildings. And this one here. So you can see it goes, the amount of damage in, uh, occurs, goes up, goes up very rapidly as you go down through through the um, temperature gauge. And this is the temperature here, 25, 30 degrees Fahrenheit at the launch of the, of the shuttle. So if, it, if they'd had the present data presented in this fashion, visualised in this fashion, they would have not have made a decision to launch this, to launch this, um, this, uh, this rocket. So, a critical mistake because they weren't visualising it properly. Okay, so we've perhaps we've I've talked about some key visualizations and the importance of getting the right data visualized in the right way, making the right connections to give you these smart insights if you like. Just a couple of slides about some of the key people involved in all this. We mentioned Hans Rosling already. Since he first appeared on the scene with that video we saw in two thousand six, he has been extremely influential in in the, uh, in the world of data visualization and showing how we can use that GapMinder software to, to create those quite engaging visualizations. Um, we've also got somebody called Edward Tuft, and he's produced, again, another influential um, <coughs> statistician and artist, and he's produced several books here, uh, of which I have two here. I got them out to. So we'll get the material for this lecture slide. I'm going to take them back to the library. So they are there. They're very, very influential publications. These, these vis visual display of quantitative information, envisioning, visioning information, very useful to look at to give you ideas for visualising your data when you come to need to do that. So Hans Rosling, very influential, and. I've also picked out this other person, a guy called David McCann, well, it's actually McCandless. And I've picked him out because he actually was a programmer before he moved into what he calls data journalism, taking data and, and, and visualising it in interesting and informative ways. And there's a, another one of his TED Talks here, The Beauty of Data Visualisation. But I want to give you a flavour of the kind of thing that he's producing with well, just a couple of minutes from, from this one here. So we'll, we'll have a look at this for a couple of minutes to show you the kind of thing, kind of stuff he's working on. Turn this off again.